All righty, let's get started. How's it going, everybody? My name is Brady O'Leary. I'm one of the co-founders of Triple Point Environmental. I've been doing this lagoon thing for about 15 years now. Uh, Patrick, in his last webinar, mentioned that he was a PhD of Lagoon University, and I don't know if I'm that accredited, so I'm going to say I'm a certified lagoonatic. Uh, what do they say? You're an expert if you have 10,000 hours of expertise in something, and I'm probably approaching $30,000 of lagoon time, uh, 30,000 hours of lagoon time, excuse me. Uh, so I have been around this block a little bit. This is the second in our series uh, on the Lagoon Masterclass. Uh, this is called Wastewater Lagoons Lagoon 101, kind of like a Lagoon Basics. We're going to do a high-level overview of Wastewater Lagoons. If you're expecting to get down into the nitty-gritty of where do I put the window on a baffle and what material does it need to be, XR5 or XR7, this is not that presentation. But fortunately for you, we will be doing other presentations like that in the future. This is a foundational overview. So let's begin. As I said, this is the second in our series of the Lagoon Masterclass. And Patrick had mentioned last time that it is hydraulics. It's a lot more than hydraulics, but does include hydraulics. Uh, we're gonna call it Lagoon 101. And we're gonna have a whole bunch of other modules here. And it's not necessarily going to be in this order, uh, but we have 12 modules planned and provided you guys keep coming. Uh, we're gonna keep making them and they'll get more nuanced uh, as time goes on. So what is the agenda here? Um, and before we get to the agenda, I guess a question in your mind, other than this guy being a certified lagoon tech, why should I listen to him? Um, it's because I've been around thousands of lagoons. I've been in them. Fortunately, not all the way. I haven't been baptized in the water yet, but I have come close. I know what wastewater tastes like, not intentionally. Here's a photo of me crossing a industrial sugar beet lagoon because um, I decided for whatever reason I needed to get a rope to the other side. Uh, this is back in the day when maybe I had a few a few fewer gray hairs in my beard. You'll notice that I have no life vest on and I'm rowing through a lot of foam. What you don't see is that foam is full of H2S and I definitely don't have a respirator on. So while your presenter here may not be smart, uh, he is stupid uh, with experience and lots of it and maybe the luck to still be around. Uh, so there's a little bit of reason maybe to maybe listen to me. So what we're gonna do here is talk about the state of, Lagu of the Lagoonian. Uh, kind of like say the union, what are the state of lagoons in general? What are the macro factors at, at play there? Next, we'll talk about why we keep saying and we genuinely believe that lagoons do it better. They're a fantastic option for a lot of the wastewater treatment facilities in the United States. <clears throat> Next, we'll talk about lagoon composition. What are the components or the features that make up a lagoon uh, and what are the considerations there? That will follow that up with talking about lagoon flow and hydraulics. How do we convey the water through the lagoon system? And lastly, we'll talk about process or the lagoon operating system. What makes the lagoon do what we want it to do? So, state of the lagoonian, which I spelled differently in this case, apparently. Um, first thing is, lagoons are kind of an old dog. Most lagoons were built after the Clean Water Act in the 1970s, and in, in most cases, I'd say at least half the cases, they haven't had any substantial upgrades since that point. Um, because of that, the technology is viewed as ancient, antiquated, old, can't do, that sort of thing. And um, as you can see over here, what we're trying to do is get this old dog to learn some new tricks. It also has a bit of an interesting landscape in the wastewater industry or the wastewater market. Um, first, you know, there's, there's the operator experience. Most of the operators that I'm, I'm working with they're not, they are not career operators that run from town to town to town, operating 10 different facilities. They're typically somebody who's come up through the DPW or has lived in the town looking for a great job and the ability to give back to their community. But because of that, a lot of operators don't have experience at more than one or two lagoons. Uh, so there's not a lot of institutionalized knowledge other than the operator has extreme knowledge of their plant. They know their plant, but they don't know lagoons in general. They know where to kick the blower to get it to start running again. Uh, but they wouldn't know where to put the aeration in a different lagoon system necessarily. Next, you have engineer experience. A lot of the engineers that are working on lagoons are in small communities. They serve counties or rural areas. Uh, and these guys and women, they have to be jack jacks of all trades. They need to work on water towers, a dam, a bridge, a whatever, and they might only be doing a wastewater lagoon system once every five, 10 years. I've met civil engineers that have never done a lagoon before. 
uh, with you know you compare that to what the general um, the general conventional wisdom is, and I get there in a second, uh, is you know most engineers push people to activate sludge plants because it's very easy to take a activated sludge plant, copy and paste it to a new location. Um, they don't you don't have they don't have that same kind of experience with lagoons. Every lagoon is a little bit custom. Um, next, you have varying manufacturer quality um, or like manufacturers of quality out there. I can name maybe 10 manufacturers that serve the lagoon space well, that are really, really amazing manufacturers. You also have a lot of manufacturers that don't have a lot of experience and decide to get into the market. And, you know, lagoons are kind of, the, you know, the facility down the street. It's the place they go to. I've seen people decide, I'm going to be a bacteria salesman, buy a tote of bacteria from, you know, Alibaba and slap a label on it. And all of a sudden they're an expert. So I think you need to be careful with the different manufacturers that are out there to make sure you're getting somebody who knows what they're doing and has lots of lagoon expertise. And lastly, uh, regulator regard. This really ch changes or depends on the state that you're in. Some states absolutely love lagoons. They recognize that this, they're not trying to design the perfect solution. They're trying to design the best solution possible with the resources available. And they recognize these small towns of 400 people don't have millions of dollars sitting underneath the mattress to build a fancy SBR or something like that. In other states, though, you know, they're not connected to the money as much, these regulators, and their job is to make sure the water is treated well. And it's very easy to say, well, this copy pasted activated sludge plant did the job for this town, so you need to do the same thing. It's kind of the easy button for them to make sure that they're doing their job right, uh, but at the expense of more complication and more cost for the towns. Um, next, in the lagoon landscape, there's not a centralized resource for education. Um, you know, you have rural water is fantastic. You have rural water equivalents all over the United States. But there's no one centralized resource. And that's actually one of the reasons we're starting to do this masterclass is to start to pu pull this wisdom that we're, we're gaining from all over the country uh, and give it to people back all over the country all at once. So this conventional wisdom is that as these old dogs age, you know, and we have to take them out to pasture or a farm in upstate New York or something like that because they just can't hack it anymore. And you know, they say, well, lagoons can't treat ammonia well, they can't treat phosphorus, this or that. We have to update it with a mechanical plant, activated sludge plant, SBR, et cetera. And we're here to say that's not the case. If anything, this whole presentation is about how we can teach that lagoon new tricks uh, to accomplish what you want to do. And in our perspective, you can get that lagoon to treat the water as good or better than that activated sludge plant. <laughs> so, Here's a really interesting image that came across my email, email inbox the other day. It doesn't matter where it is. I see this all over the United States over and over again. Conventional wisdom is lagoon's not working anymore, lagoon bad, and we need to update it with something fancy, something mechanical, mechanical good. And engineers do this quite a bit. In this case, it looks like they stopped using the lagoons here and they filled in the polishing cell and built a mechanical plant. I don't know why this was decided. I, I'm not even part of this project. I'm not even interacting with this town. It was another vendor shared this image with me. It, this is just emblematic of the overall experience. And I'd like to walk through this a little bit because I like this, this case a lot. It's a lagoon system, 0.9 MGD, pretty high VOD, 300 milligrams a liter coming in, normal ammonia, 30 coming in. Um, and let's, let's evaluate this a little bit further. <clears throat> And I, I put the phrase on the screen, lagoon bad. And I really want to kind of drive this home because people have this idea that lagoons are just bad. You know, they think of a lagoon as a big pile of poop, a big pool of poop, right? Here's a town in Pennsylvania that had a, quite an issue with a lagoon that they were looking at building. And they even had this fun acronym, Canon Resonance Against Poop or CRAP because lagoons are full of crap in more ways than one, apparently. And if you think I'm kidding, this is like a really big deal. They had rallies, they had signs, farmers are posting this stuff. There's a sense that lagoons stink, lagoons are terrible, lagoons are dirty, it's gonna pollute our water. And that's not the case. It's just people don't understand that there are modern ways of implementing lagoons that are not bad. So back to it. Let's compare the, the new conventional wisdom to the old lagoon system that was here. And if I'm an operator, I'm gonna say, what's it like to operate these things? Let's put them head to head. So if I'm an operator, I've got to check the screens. I guess this site has screens. So what, uh, what's clogging the screens, gotta clean those out. Gotta make sure the flow is going to the lagoon system as we expect, pretty, pretty straightforward. Maybe if there's an aeration system, check that. Make sure there's bubbles going or the surface aerators are moving. Things are being mixed as we expect. Check the UV, are all the bulbs working? Is the power on? What's going on there? And then test the effluent. 
is it within the parameters that we expect? Uh, if I'm an operator and I run a lagoon system, this is great. It takes me an hour in the morning or a couple of hours, and then I go do the other 50 things I have to do in a day. Now, if I'm that same operator and you upgrade the wastewater lagoon system to this activated slush plant over here, actually, we're not there yet. We're, we're on money now. Over on the lagoon system, it costs some money, but it's pretty inexpensive. Um, and let's say this town's even forward thinking and they're budgeting 20 grand a year for an eventual quarter million dollar sludge removal in 10 or 15 years. So we'll give it $2 signs. Okay, now let's look at it over here on the activated sludge plant side. You know, gotta check the screens, gotta get that crap out of there, gotta make sure the lift station pumps are working properly. There's another screen, a one millimeter screen is catching way more stuff because we can't get any grit into this, this little tank because it'll fill up and then we'll lose volume. So we gotta check that, that, uh, that stuff there. Gotta remove those solids and haul them off site. Gotta check the aeration system, make sure that's running right. Make sure the DO's right because if you get a slug of something coming in, uh, it might uh, upset the, the system. So DO has got to be kept just right, otherwise we won't treat the water. <clears throat> got to settle the solids out, how's that working? And then when we settle the solids out, there's waste RAS, got to put that somewhere, got to haul that off site. And then there's a pump, make sure the pump returning, return sludge to the, the activated sludge plant is working properly. Is the MLSS right? Is it 3,000, is it 4,000? Where does it need to be here? Make sure the pH is right, the flow is right, the temperature is right. Um, when we remove phosphorus, phosphorus and settle that out, we have to settle it out and remove it somewhere, then check the UV, then test the effluent. And if I'm looking at this, this is way more work. And any one of these steps screws up, that, that uh, we're not hitting our, our limits on the tail end. And this costs way more money to build, way more money to operate, and has a more expensive operator or operator level here. So it's a pretty big deal. And this is why we say lagoons do it better. It is simply a better choice for communities that already have, especially communities that already have wastewater lagoons. So it's a bit of, in my mind, this is a testament to lagoons. Here's, you know, two different plants. You have different methods, different costs, different hassle, different maintenance costs. And it's literally the same outcome. This Activated sludge plant is putting out 10 to 50 BOD and 20 to 30 ammonia, which I think can be fixed and worked on. But that lagoon system can do exactly that. We can actually hit 10 milligrams a liter BOD and zero ammonia coming out of that same lagoon system without upgrading to an activated sludge plant. So this is why we're just heavy advocates for wastewater lagoons. So kind of a summarizing here, why do we think lagoons do it better? They're the best situation for small communities. It's like a crock pot, you turn it on and forget it, make sure it's still on and the heat's still on. They're simpler, they're reliable, they handle challenges and flow variants as well. If you get, somebody dumps a tanker of something down the drain, the lagoon's not gonna get too upset about it. Uh, you can't do that to an activated sludge plant. Uh, and they're pretty easy to maintain provided that you're forward thinking and plan. Next, lagoons can do it better. You know, they are the best solution, but also they can be better than they are today. There's newer technologies that weren't out 10 years ago or 20 years ago that can make your lagoon treat water better than an activated sludge plant, should you want it to. And probably the most important here is that they're the most cost effective. First of all, most of these towns already have a lagoon system. They have a lower operating cost. If you look over here, this is a study done in South Africa where lagoons have, by an order of magnitude, the lowest electrical intensity and therefore lowest emissions uh, how much energy it takes to do the job compared to anything else. It's 0 0.08 here. And you compare that to an ox, an ox ditch, which is 0.48, just a massive difference in power cost. Um, and also uh, they're more cost effective because we don't need to get a class one or class A operator um, you know, in a town of 200 people. It's kind of difficult to get somebody that has that experience in, in a town of that size. Um, there's more operator options as well. Lagoons are generally best for those who have land available. So that's why you tend to find them in rural areas. Fortunately, America's pretty big and got a lot of rural areas. Um, and this land should be pretty inexpensive. If you're trying to build one of these in Central Park, you're probably not gonna find that too cost effective. Um, and in general, it's nice to have an area with a few neighbors because whether or not a lagoon stinks, because it shouldn't, um, people don't like to live next door to that if they know what it is. Um, industrial plants also love these things. A lot of these industrial plants are process water intensive. They want a system that's really easy because they're in the business of whatever, breaking down hogs or treating cherry waste. They're not in the business of treating wastewater. They want something that's easy, that gives them flexibility. At the end of the day, is the most cost effective solution for them. That's why you see lagoons all over these industrial plants. In general, we see lagoons 
in small communities overall, usually around 10,000 people or less. Above that point, it's just too dense. The community is too dense to uh, support the land lagoon needs. So let's talk about lagoon composition now. And we're gonna break this down into a few categories. First, keeping the water in, how to keep the water in this hole we dig. Next, what are the physical characteristics of a lagoon? And then lastly, flow and hydraulics, how do we get water through it? So keeping the water in, let's talk about liner materials, liner protection, and liner issues. So liner materials, the most common one that we see lagoons uh, having is that this is because most lagoons were built with this, this way in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, is with a clay liner or a bentonite liner. What they do is they compact the soil, they bring in lots of clay, which will absorb the water and create a seal. And then they put 18 inches to two feet of this clay, sometimes three feet of this clay down, compact it to the engineer's standards. And this will seal pretty well. It's not perfect. There's a lot of room for human error here. So if somebody accidentally takes some rebar and pokes it through a few areas, those might be leaf pads. So it's not perfectly impenetrable, but in general, you're gonna hang on to the water with a clay liner. Most modern lagoons these days are built with an HDPE liner. It's synthetic. You can see some people rolling it out here on, on the bottom. And it comes in giant sheets, and then these are fused at the seam. And provided that you have a quality individual out there, it's pretty easy to fuse these things, and it's pretty easy to test and repair should there be a leak. This is a way to get um, your lagoon to seal a little bit more uh, a little bit more effectively. I will say one of the Achilles heels of lagoon systems is this liner. They're just expensive. You think, oh, that's just plastic. What's that? A hundred grand, you know? Even though it's kind of pricey, a lot of these liners are. 2 million bucks, a million bucks, it's a pretty big deal, but it's a pretty important thing as well. You don't want wastewater getting underneath it. You'll see why in a second. And you also don't want to be polluting uh, your town's waterways where you, know, you fish for trout. <laughs> so we put the liner in, now we want to protect it. Uh, liner protection is a pretty big deal. The most common one that we see is riprap. And this can be put on clay. I've seen this put on HTP as well. Um, it's a pretty good way of making sure we don't damage that liner. And riprap is, it could be rocks, limestone, or otherwise the size of a tennis ball all the way up to, I've seen basketballs are bigger. Uh, you can argue with your engineer about what's better, but rock will protect the shore. And you wanna protect it for a few reasons. One, you don't wanna put a boat or something else through the liner on the shore. I have seen this happen multiple times when people try to get a boat out there to do some maintenance and they drop it from you know the backhoe they're picking it up with. So. Uh, don't want to have to deal with that. Uh, a liner will also prevent muskrats from burrowing, especially into clay, because they'll burrow deep enough that they'll create a hole. We don't want to, we don't want that to happen, so we make the whole bank inhospitable to them. The riprap will also prevent erosion. You spend a lot of money to build the slope, this berm. You don't want it, uh, the wave action and the ice uh, movement to be pulling this down into the lagoon, minimizing your volume. And lastly, riprap will prevent sun penetration especially with clay liners or in HDPE liners that have solids build up on them. If the sun gets all the way to the bottom, you're gonna get vegetation growing in whatever that substrate is. That's not a very good thing for a wastewater lagoon system. So uh, riprap will prevent that. So what are the issues? There aren't too many issues with liners other than holes, right? Um, but this one's really curious. I wanted to share this. I saw this at a um, technical conference where somebody drained their lagoon, they, they found like it wasn't holding water. They drained it and they found this, which is the craziest thing that I've, I've seen and was perplexed until I was shown what happens, like the surface of the moon. And what happened was, this was actually a dual, a, a HTPE liner and they have soil on top to weigh that down and still this happened. And each one of those is a weak point. So what happened was there was a flood and the lagoon burned, the operator went out, rode a boat out, to check that you know we're not putting wastewater into the, this this flood. He's like, cool, lagoons hanging onto the water, no problem there. This is really really great. The bank was not overtopped. But then what they found out was that the water pressure beneath the lagoon, it's like putting a bathtub out in an ocean uh, or a pool. The water pressure underneath it was too much pressure, and it blew up through the liner through the bottom. So the berm didn't break but the liner did from underneath. I don't know how you prevent this, but just something to keep in mind, uh, the berm is not the only way that water gets out of your lagoon. More common than not, what we see here are these, They're called, we call them whales. Um, it's where you get a hole in your lagoon liner, water starts trickling out, with that water goes waste, 
and that waste starts to break down anaerobically under the liner. And for those in the know or those who come to module, I don't know, Masterclass Module 7, we'll learn about anaerobic digestion. The, well, the byproduct of that is methane H2S. In general, it's just gas. And that gas has nowhere to go. It's underneath basically a balloon and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up. I guess the point where, I mean, this is pretty crazy. I've ne never seen one this big in person. Something like that might need, I don't know, Captain Ahab to go out there and pop it for us. Um, but I'd be careful because inside of that is a lot of stink, a lot of H2S and a lot of methane. So it might be flammable too. Next, let's talk about physical dimensions, and I've broken it down into quantity, shape, slope, depth, and volume. So cell quantity, uh, some lagoon systems elect to have a single cell. This is the cheapest way to do it. You're just digging one hole, it's one liner. There's no transfer structure of pipes. Uh, it's a way that if you have a footprint uh, that you wanna use for your lagoons, it's a way to maximize volume. It's just, you're taking the whole footprint and making it one big volume. So this is an, this was on top a one cell lagoon. It's a actually cherry and fruit processor in Michigan. I can see all the Gaylords in the back stacked up where the fruit boxes are. Um, they don't care that much about treatment. Uh, they just want to hang on to the water that they use for process. They want to take the edge off. They want to take the odor off. They lower the BOD a little bit, and then they irrigate it on a nearby field. So they don't really care about getting the the most treatment out of the cell. In general though, we find the best solution is multiple cells and the three cell lagoon is, is the most common and I would say it's probably the most effective number. The cool thing about breaking it up into multiple cells is you reduce short circuiting. You know, right here, let's say this is the influent, the water can just beeline it. It doesn't zigzag through here. It, it can beeline it for the exit. If you break it up, the water has to go through here and enter here and it has to go down here and enter this next pond. So multiple cells prevent water from beelining it to the exit, which you could read as waste or untreated waste, making it straight for your effluent pipe. Um, and because of this, we're kind of holding the waste back into the treatment system. We get increased treatment. Our experience is that for every cell we add up to, you know, four or five, we get about 15% more treatment per cell that we add. It's a pretty big deal. So you actually, if you break up your land into multiple cells, you can get treatment down to lower effluent levels. And this is because the lagoons, in addition to minimizing short circuiting, they kind of specialize. The first lagoon grows bacteria and specialize for higher BOD. The next lagoon and the diatoms and everything else specialize for low BOD. And the last lagoon is built and used primarily for polishing. And then pro tip here, you can actually artificially create more cells you don't have to add a, a earthen berm. You can actually add a baffle, and that will create this effect where you get more treatment simply by adding a baffle. So you can get more cells by having more cells or just by throwing a baffle in there. <clears throat> Next, the shape. This isn't really a big deal. Uh, it is to an extent, but you, you generally are gonna find some form of rectangle cell. Rectangle because you want to put the water in one end and have it stick around for a while and transfer out the back end. If it was square, you're just moving the influent closer to the effluent. So rectangle kind of elongates and holds onto the water as much as possible. And then it's rectangle as well because it's kind of just cheaper to build a rectangle than a circle. That's one big radius. It's expensive to tell the contractor to do it. You lose volume and it's just more tedious to do. So you tend not to see not to see round radiuses unless in it's necessary to fit onto a site for some reason or another. Right here, for example, there's a drainage culvert that goes through, so they had around it right there. Um, and you can see some pretty crazy things too. Here's a sugar beet plant up in Minnesota, I believe. These things are like, they're almost a half mile long. Like you could legit get out here and water ski for like minutes uh, on this thing. I wouldn't recommend it, it's like 30,000 BOD, but you could do it if you were adventurous enough. Next, let's talk slope. And here is, you're probably confused a little bit, but if you watch masterclass number one, Pat decided to, or Patrick, as he wants to say, uh, decided to, you know, ha have some fun at my expense. I uh, decided to return the favor. So here is a photo of Patrick. He was at an operator's conference and there was this cardboard cutout you can go put your head up on. And he did that, took a photo, and I'm going to use it to prove a point here. So this is Patrick. Uh, I guess you could say this is, Set of physical dimensions. This is like peak physical specimen here. And he decides to take his shirt off, get out and go get a tan, walk in some lagoons. And he's gonna help us figure out what slope is best for a wastewater lagoon system. But something's not quite right yet. It's not quite Patrick. Here we go. Let's give him a tattoo. Little lagoons do it better. No, it's Patrick. Let's go. So you've got Goldilocks here. You've got three different lagoons. 
very broad slope, medium slope, and a uh, very steep slope. Pat's out walking the lagoon systems here, takes a look at this one and says, okay, this has the least volume given the footprint that we have here, not really ideal. The bottom is might as well be a potion stamp. So if, if he wants to get out there and put diffused aeration, he can't do it uh, easily at least. So he's gonna have to use surface aeration, but even then it can only be out in the middle out here because over here is too close to the bottom, making a propeller scouring the bottom. Uh, also, he's noticing, I can see the bottom. I can see most of the bottom. Uh, and that means the sunlight's getting down there and we're gonna grow lots and lots of green stuff, more algae, more cattails, and that's gonna be a headache for Pat as he operates this lagoon. Doesn't love it. Checks up this one here in the middle, middle sees got more volume, he's got more bottom. You know, if he wants to put an aerator out there, he can do it. He's like, okay, I can see a little bit of the slope, but eventually it gets dark and I can't see the entire slope. Sunlight's not getting all the way down there. He loves this one at first. Says, okay, same footprint as the other two, but I got the maximum volume. It's maximum bottom. I thought about making a joke and saying Pat's nickname should be maximum bottom, um, but maybe I won't lean into that one too much. Um, recognizes that there's no sunlight at the bottom. Very little of the slope is visible, but then he realizes the slope's a little bit unstable and it's prone to erosion. Eventually, Pat might end up in the bottom of that lagoon and the lagoon will end up spilling. So this is just not a direction we can go. In general, what we know from slopes is that three to one, four to one are great numbers. It's kind of the Goldilocks zone. Gives you the footprint at the bottom. You can put some aeration down there, um, minimizes sunlight, and it is pretty good from a volume standpoint. Okay, let's talk about depth. And depth is pretty important. If you look over here on the left side, if you have diffused aeration, depth is, is great. If you're releasing bubbles from the bottom, the deeper that water column, the more time that bubble's hanging out as it rises to the top, that's where it transfers its oxygen. So the deeper you go, you get more oxygen transfer if you have diffused aeration. Um, 16, or 16 feet is kind of the high end, eight to 16 is ideal for diffused aeration. Now, uh, it's also important, depth is important from a aeration standpoint and in general. So you've got diffused aeration, it's better with depth. Depth is a good thing. If you have mechanical aeration, depth is a bit of a challenge. Um, the deeper you go, the difficult, more difficult it is for surface aerators to get their oxygen and mixing all the way to the bottom. So you can't go too shallow because your, your propeller would dam damage the liner and you can't go too deep uh, because you're not, you're not you're kind of leaving the bottom of the pond quiescent the deeper you go. Uh, so depth is pretty important for mixing in general. But mixing is a big deal. If the deeper you go for diffused aeration, the more time these bubbles drag the water, you get more gallons move per minute. So this is one little baby six foot, seven foot aerator, but you can see, maybe you can't through the webinar, but there's a tan circle around every one of these aerators where you can see the disturbed water. It's 125 feet across from one little aerator. And the reason that we're getting so much mixing here is because this pond is 16 feet deep and that 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 helps, that leverages the aerator's energy it's putting in to pack a big punch from a mixing standpoint. Uh, next, depth is a huge component of volume. I mean, it's one of the three things you multiply together to get volume. So if you take an average five acre pond, for every foot you add, you're adding 1.5 million gallons of water. That's just an average five, five acre pond. I've seen 20 acre ponds. So every little bit of depth makes a big deal from a HRT standpoint. Um, there is kind of a practical limit and that's just because people don't wanna dig holes down, down below 25 feet or don't wanna pump air down that deep. Most lagoons we see are in the eight to maybe 20 foot, 18 foot range. That's pretty general. And depth also, as I mentioned before, allows sunlight penetration. And this is a double-edged sword because, you know, if, you're, if you have some algae out there, that sunlight and algae are gonna produce oxygen during the day, but they're gonna suck oxygen out at night. So in general, we like to minimize sunlight penetration as much, much as possible and, and we air towards deeper lagoons. Sunlight has a hard time getting much deeper than eight feet. Five to eight feet, it rarely starts to taper off and beyond that point, won't be too much of an issue. And next, volume. Volume is huge. Volume is everything. Volume, how much water you have out there leads to hydraulic retention time, how long you can actually hang on to the waste that you put in. Basically, it's like a bigger battery. You can store more stuff in it. Um, and the longer you can hang on to the water, the more time we have to treat it, which means we can treat more with uh, higher HRTs and higher volumes. 
and I had Shakti, our process engineer, laboriously create this chart for me. Thank you very much, Shakti. Uh, he worked really uh, for, for an hour on this for me. And what this shows is we have a uh, lagoon volume on this side, a 1 million gallon lagoon, pretty little lagoon, all the way up to a 20 million gallon lagoon, good sized lagoon. And then we have flow on top, 0.1 MGD, all the way up to a million gallons per day. If you take a 5 million gallon a day lagoon, it, it, it can treat 640 milligrams a liter down to 30 milligrams a liter of BOD at one uh, point, 100,000 gallons per day. If we go up to 400,000 gallons per day, we can only treat 180 milligrams a liter down to 30, all the way down to at a million gallons a day. That five billion gallon lagoon can only treat 90 milligrams a liter down to 30 milligrams a liter. Um, so what you see is you add volume. Let's take this cell right here. Uh, to, we're trying to do a million gallons a day, and in a with a one day HRT, one million gallon lagoon, we can only treat 40 milligrams a liter down to 30. You can't treat a whole lot in one day. The longer we hang on to that water in that same cell, we can treat a million gallons a day from 275 down to 30. Um, so point being, the more water you get out there, the more treatment you can get done. And this gets pretty crazy. If you get over to 0.2 MGD and a 20 million gallon a day lagoon, you can treat industrial strength wastewater in that lagoon uh, at 2.2 MGD, a pretty good flow, uh, provided you've got the HRT to do it. Okay, hydraulics and flow. So we're gonna talk about the ins and the outs, getting the water into the pond, where does it go in the pond, and where does it go after the pond. We'll talk a little bit more about baffles. We'll talk about storage and why that's important for lagoons. Freeboard, those are gonna go together a little bit. And then discharge, where do we put this water when we're done with it? I guess that's outs too, but forgive me. Okay, so ins. Uh, we gotta get water into the cell and screening in general for lagoons is optional. Lagoons have space for solid storage at the bottom, but from Triple Point's perspective, and let me speak for all manufacturers, please do it. Um, and it's gonna make your life as an operator easier, even though it's more work during the day, it's gonna make your life easier eventually when you have to upgrade your lagoon or maintain your lagoon, we highly recommend it. And what it is in general is we have a pretty coarse screen on the front end. They can go down to half an inch, but most are a one inch bar screen, inch and a half bar screen. And the intent is if you have, I don't know, a tennis ball that comes through or large pieces of plastic or rags that come through, this will hang on to it, it'll catch it. And you can either get out there and manually remove it. You can see it here. There are automated bar screens that will automatically do this for you. Here is a screw uh, screen, it's a perforated uh, area at the bottom where the water goes through and the screw pulls solids up and dumps it into a, a, a garbage can. It is more work. You're going to have to empty that garbage can every couple of days or every week or so. But the benefits are, one, you're removing BOD. And a piece of plastic, or you know, let's talk about some rags that are going in, um, some uh, amalgamated feminine products or whatever. Or we've been by, we've done work for prisons and we'll put sheets down there. Even though that's not typical, typical organic waste as you think about it, it's not BOD5. You're not breaking down a, you know, a set of comforters in a day or five days, but that's BOD100, that's BOD1000. As that thing breaks down, it is a BOD demand to your lagoon. And if you can pull that out on the front end with a coarse screen, you're saving your lagoon a lot of headaches and a lot of challenge in the future. This will also help you remove rags. And those rags are going to bind up on the propellers of surface aerators. It's going to wrap on the tethers of diffused air. It's going to wrap on anything out in that pond. And it's just a hassle to deal with. It's going to reduce lagoon trash or tampon applicators or, or anything else that comes down into your lagoon and ends up stuck in the rip wrap all the way around. Uh, it will reduce that. And it's going to help remove solids that are going to build up in your pond and make you have to remove sludge sooner. As I said, it does come with some increased maintenance. You got to pay for it. There is increased cost there. But if you can get this in your budget, I highly recommend it. Talking about the outs now, about the front end of the lagoon where the water comes in, on the back end, right before it goes out, we have some level of disinfection. Most lagoon systems, especially the older ones, will have chlorine disinfection. They'll have a chlorine contact chamber like this. And what they'll do is they'll mix some chlorine on the front end, they'll put it through a tortured path as it goes through, give the chance for that chlorine to contact and mix with the water. And the whole point here is to kill any residual bacteria that's coming out the back end most notably fecal coliform. Um, most of the fecal coliform will be removed in the treatment process because as we remove BOD in the lagoon system, we're removing the food for that fecal coliform to exist. Um, but there's still going to be some left and what we're doing is just 
you know, sorry, bud, your, your, your job's done. You take them out at the tail end. More commonly in new lagoon systems, plants are going to UV disinfection. There's no consumable or at least daily consumable where you have to add chlorine. What they do is put bulbs that eventually have to be replaced in there. And these bulbs release, re, uh, release ultraviolet radiation. And these bacteria are, it's not like us, you know, Patrick out there on the lagoon system trying to get a tan. These bugs don't tan, they just die. Um, so this will essentially denature them and they die pretty quickly. This is very effective. And again, this is where most plants are going these days. Plus I think it just looks cool. Okay, so that's the, the macro in and out. Now let's talk about how we're situating our lagoons. We can do this in one of two ways. We can either do it through parallel flow or series flow. If we have multiple lagoons, where does the water go? The parallel flow is the water comes in and then is split into two parallel trains. There's two cells here that are basically a cell 1A and cell 1B. They treat at the same time. Uh, and ideally, if there's the water split, they treat the same thing at the same time. And then the water comes out, joins a pipe, and then either goes to a next step here to under a clarifier, or it might go to discharge or some other lagoon system. This is generally not that seen, um, especially these days. It can be difficult to split the, the flow accurately, so one lagoon might be might getting more than the other. Um, but the reason it's generally done is you can take down 50% of your wastewater treatment plant, you can drain it, you can do work on it if you want to, you can fix a liner, and the other half can continue its process. It might not be treating as much because you're putting twice as much waste through it, but you can still do it. Um, the other cool thing with parallel is you can A-B test. So this is an activated sludge plant, and this operator can say, I'm gonna run this cell at three milligrams a liter and this cell at one milligram a liter, um, trying to figure out if he can save money or not. And uh, he can run that test, assuming that the water split pretty well and get a sense of how these lagoons operate. Um, in general, we only really see these in high intensity applications like this one, this is a cheese and, and municipal combo plant, um, industrial in general. Theories is kind of the way to go for most muni plants. And the idea is the water comes in, it's held in one cell, we move it to the next cell in the series, move it to the next cell in the series, and then we discharge. So it's like a chain, if that makes sense. And this is de facto creating extra cells or, or it's a baffle. We're hanging on to the waste and preventing it from exiting. So we get less uh, short circuiting and each cell kind of specializes to the waste load that it's receiving. So you get a little bit better treatment when you go in series. You get 10 to 20% better treatment if you go series over parallel. Um, in general, this is what we recommend for most muni plants. Industrially, it's kind of a toss up. Um, so let's talk about influent and effluent uh, location. And here's the reason that we want to talk about it. This is a plant we did a long time ago, 2010 or so. We thought, or we're told, the influent was right here, up here where my mouse is, and then here's this little nub right here. This is the effluent. Um, you can see it. Um, the lagoon wasn't treating water as well, and one of the things we eventually did is like, okay, let's do a dye test because something's not right here. And we found out, you'll notice, that the water doesn't come out over here. It comes up directly up. The pipe aims up at the surface right here. And then you'll see the green beeline it for the exit right here pretty immediately. So what's happening is this, this water is short circuiting before it ever gets any, up, anywhere up here. So the influent location and the effluent location are super, super important. Um, here's another look at this. So here's a plant that's got influent coming up through these pipes, transfers to the cell here, transfers in series to the cell here, and then goes out. And you can see, I can't pause this unfortunately, that the water kind of beelines it over here for this exit, goes right here and then swirls around and then crosses right here. Let's do that again, let's go back. Crop, come on. Well, that might be the only time we see it. Okay, okay, we're just gonna let that one go. What you would see is when the water crosses, it would swirl around right here and then go along this bank to the exit, leaving a big dead zone right here. So even though we're trying to separate these things, uh, short circuiting still occurs. So locating these as far apart from each other as possible cell to cell is super important to maximize the HRT and the treatment in each one of these cells. Uh, another way that we can do that is with baffles. Again, I was kind of explaining the wastewater beelining it for the exit. This is what water is going to do. It's going to take the path of least resistance. It's not going to go kind of like my mom goes through a grocery store and go through every single aisle. It's like, it doesn't want to do that. It wants to get, it's kind of like a man. It wants to go in, get what it wants, and get straight out. Um, 
that's I, I hate grocery stores with a passion. So if I had to go through aisles like you, like you have to at Ikea or Aldi or something like that, um, it forces you to spend more time in a place. It's essentially what's happening here. Baffles do just that. They slow you down and they make you take a tortured path, which means you're utilizing more of the cell and hanging on to that waste uh, longer instead of it going straight for the exit. So a baffle is a great way to get more treatment out of the lagoon system and control the flow in the lagoon system. This is what's called plug flow. Essentially, it is we're forcing the water to go in a tortured passion, fashion through the lagoon system. Talk about hydraulics and flow. Um, so uh, the first is storage. Um, lagoons are generally built to store some sludge. On day one, it's got no sludge, but on year 20, it's going to have a couple feet. And that takes up space where water is not. It's just sludge. So you're not going to get treatment because most of the treatment's happening in the, in the liquid zone. Um, so we build that into lagoons, expect there to be some solids. Then you have a water area where this is where the treatment's going to happen. This, when we say HRT, this is what we think about. How long are we hanging on to the water in the zone to get treatment? Um, and then lagoons will have part of their, their depth might be storage for water that we would want to hang on to to maybe irrigate at a certain point or when the crops are dry, or maybe we want to discharge at a certain time of the month, certain time of the year. We can have storage. Where the, basically, the lagoon just fills up more and more and more in the storage zone, um, and then we discharge when we want to. So building storage into the freeboard is important. A lot of lagoons have, especially in uh, rainy climates, have a rainfall factor. Basically, your average rainfall might add an inch or two. Make sure we build that in. They also accommodate a 25-year or sometimes even 100-year storm to make sure we don't overtop the lagoon. And then lastly, we want freeboard. This is basically an area where we don't have anything because um, we don't. It is really not a good idea to overtop the lagoon system. The EPA will probably frown upon that, so we have a little bit of a buffer to prevent that from happening. In general, what we see is usually about three feet from the top of the berm to the top of the water level is a pretty common freeboard. And then from a sludge storage standpoint, we usually see a foot to two feet of expected sludge storage at the bottom. And then discharge, where do we put it when we're done? Uh, we can direct discharge, and this could be into a river or a stream. Uh, very rarely is it into a lake. That does happen sometimes. Basically, the, the facility just discharges to another body of water and it carries the, the water away. Um, another discharge method is percolation. So this can be done in a wetland, this can be done in a percolation basin. Essentially, it's this big area that's not lined very well, and the anticipation is it's pretty shallow, it's going to be kind of a natural habitat, and the water is going to percolate down to through the soil, um, and whatever's left over from a BOD standpoint is going to get captured in that kind of filtering action. You can also see rapid infiltration basins here in the same, with the same kind of theory that um, you get out there, you turn the sand over, you can remediate the sand should you need to. This is a little bit less common. You see irrigation. You see a lot of this industrially, where this, that industrial plant that I mentioned earlier, they hang on to the water and they irrigate out here. Uh, they get rid of the water, which is great. It also percolates to the soil, but the side benefit here is they get to grow some corn or pay a farmer or get dividends from a farmer to, to grow the corn out there. And this application, it's organic waste. It's not human waste. So it's actually just free fertilizer for that farmer. Pretty big deal. Uh, and then next, we have plants that will pre-treat, and then they discharge to a wastewater treatment plant, or POTW. Um, you see this a lot industrially, where they'll take their wastewater from 1,000 milligrams a liter down to 100 milligrams a liter, or something along those lines. And then the cost for them to get it refined thereafter is too high. They say, that's not our job, and they'll just, you know, or we're not good at that, and they'll send it to the local wastewater plant uh, for a kind of final polishing or treatment. Okay, so let's talk about the operating system. What's what, what goes in the lagoon to make it work? And you hear the word aeration a lot. Let's talk about it. I think the definition of this is pretty important. You've probably heard this from us before. Aeration is not just adding oxygen to water. It is. It's adding air to the water so the oxygen is transferred to the water. Uh, it, it is also uh, mixing. The US EPA says aeration is adding oxygen to the water and mixing such that the air, the waste, in the bacteria are always in contact. If you put a bubble a, a, a mile away in a lake and have a bacteria a mile away, that bacteria cannot respirate from that bubble. We need mixing to make sure everything is, is mixed together. And it's super important. And you can say, well, I'm facultative. I don't have aeration. Yes, you do. It, it, you're still relying on it. It's the heart of your treatment, whether or not you're aware. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, 
aeration is fantastic. You'll we'll probably have a module on just this in the future. But from a high level, it's gonna it's gonna demolish BOD. It's gonna treat ammonia really well in certain conditions. Uh, how much aeration you add will determine how much water and how much loading you can put into your lagoon. That means you can put more out there, uh, more waste. In, you know, you pack it really in in a small spot if you add more aeration. This on the right is actually an anaerobic plant from a, a rendering plant, actually. A couple of blowers on shore. It's pretty nasty. Not a typical lagoon, but I think it looks kind of fun. Um, that lagoon right there did not stink. Even though I'm standing right next to 400 milligrams a liter, 500 milligrams a liter, tons of ammonia, doesn't smell because it's properly aerated. Aeration will also abate algae growth. Algae doesn't like high turbulent environments. Uh, it will minimize sludge accumulation, so you don't have to remove sludge as often. Aeration will help to hold the water back, so it will prevent short circuiting. It can lower your operational cost. If you have an inefficient aeration system, you can upgrade it to a more efficient operate, uh, system that will actually save you money over time. And in general, aeration is why lagoons are that crock pot. It's why they're predictable, it's why they're reliable, and you get great consistent performance. So how do we aerate? And other than the mixing, which, I mean, obviously you guys see what, what mixing means. Um, it is a combination of an air and water interface. And we say air because most aeration is done with ambient air. The air that we breathe right now has 21, 22% oxygen in it. And that's, a pretty, that's quite a bit of oxygen. If we just get that mixed around with water, it's gonna transfer that oxygen across the barrier into the water and create dissolved oxygen. Um, it is impacted by pressure. So elevation matters and the depth of the pond matters. It's, it's impacted by turbulence. The more turbulent the bubble is, the more you're gonna transfer that oxygen to the water. If you churn it up, you're gonna get more transfer. Um, and it will help to generally circulate the water as well. So there's a couple different types of aeration. There's natural aeration. So this is the aeration that's happening, whether or not you think it is, you're getting free aeration just by having a lagoon. Uh, there's mechanical agitation, there's air diffusion, and oxygen injection. We're actually not gonna talk about that one. That's kind of a, that's a 200 level discussion and opinion, not for today. So natural aeration. This pond right here has no aeration that you can see out there, right? But it is aerated and it is a facultative pond and they expect the bottom to have low DO. The top actually has pretty good DO. That's because it's got a lot of surface area. It's a big pond and the oxygen can transfer into that pond just by nature of the air being against the top of that pond. Wind ripples actually will help to increase this. Those ripples, those little white caps you see out on your lagoon, when the wind blows across it, that's aeration happening right there. And that rippling will actually also help the pond to mix or turn over as well. Um, algae will produce DO. Algae will, I mean, in some ponds, this, this pond right here will, will turn super, super green in the summer. You'll get super saturated. I mean, you'll see DO of 15 milligrams a liter, which is, a, is above the saturation point in ponds like this, because that algae is just pumping out oxygen like a plant or you know photosynthesizing during the day doesn't do it at night though so be careful about algae it'll actually do the opposite at night um, and lastly some lagoons will have a little waterfall on the tail end where the water trickles over something that wave action or that waterfall action will increase do as well you've got mechanical surface aerators so you've got splashers here aspirators right here um, this is a house it's a brush splasher essentially. The principle here is we're throwing water in the air, we're moving it with a propeller, we're moving the water to get the air in it. That's generally how surface aerators work. That's how they get that interface. The flip side of that is diffused aeration where we are, instead of moving the water to get it interfacing with the air, we're moving the air to get it interfacing with the water. And in general, it's just easier to move air than it is to move water. So this is kind of where the industry has been moving. You might see perforated tubing, disc diffusers, tube diffusers, coarse bubble diffusers. These are really big bubbles. They're not as efficient as these really little bubbles. But again, we're kind of aeration, it's an aeration module conversation. Uh, in general, the air is being released from the bottom. And it's kind of a black box, right? Like you can't see what's going on here other than some foam. Um, so the aeration is actually sitting on the bottom and then the bubbles rise up to the surface. This is how diffused aeration goes. And then instead of having motors out on the water, there's one or two blowers on shore that will pump air through an onshore header network. The air will come out through these, these risers and then go down to each individual aerator. 
Every manufacturer does this a little bit differently, but the, the point is the air is put at the bottom of the pond and then bubbles all the way to the top, creating that mixing action from the top. Um, just a high level conversation, really, really, really focus on the cost of power to treat your wastewater with aeration. It is the number one cost in running a wastewater lagoon system. Typically, if you're aerated, 80% of the cost is gonna be how much energy that aeration system uses. So if you can save 20 grand a year on power, you're saving that 20 grand every single year for your um, your community. We'll get more into efficiency and costs in the future, but if you're looking at aeration right now, looking at the different efficiencies and relying on independent evaluations, don't necessarily listen to what they say they're gonna do. Like I said, some of the manufacturers in a, in a lagoon space uh, might be prone to snake oil salesmanship, um, get independent verification of that OTE or auction transfer efficiency. If you have any questions on that, we've got a, a number of webinars on this as well. And like I said, we'll do a masterclass on this too. So where's the aeration needed? Um, the aeration is generally needed where there's the most demand. So if you look here, this is a, uh, this is DeSoto, Iowa. Um, and you can see there's more aerators here because the wastewater comes in up here. Uh, less aerators here because there's less air demand here. Basically, for every 1.5 pounds, I'm sorry, for every one pound of BOD that we treat, we want to add 1.5 pounds of oxygen. And the BOD is higher on the front end than the back end. Same with ammonia. For every 4.6 pounds of, or sorry, for every one pound of ammonia we want to treat, we need 4.6 pounds of oxygen. In this case, that ammonia treatment is actually happening back here. So all that air is going into this reactor right here. We want to put the air where the reaction or the bacteria needs it most. Um, air can also be important for benthyl feedback. If you have a lot of sludge in the lagoon system, we'll cover this more in a future module, but sludge can produce BOD, it can produce ammonia, uh, it breaks down anaerobically and starts releasing some nasty stuff. You might need some air on the tail end. If this was full of sludge, you might consider adding a little bit of aeration on the back end, because even though this BOD isn't making it there, there could be BOD being released there. So it's something to think about. And also, you might need air on the tail end for a DO limit. Maybe you're running all of your lagoons at four milligrams a liter, but the you know, DEQ tells you you need to have five milligrams a liter to discharge to some fancy stream with some whatever, protective salamanders or something in it. Um, you need to raise the DO on the tail end. You might need aeration at the back end for that purpose. And fun fact, how do we know other than the aerator placement where the BOD is coming in here? If you look here, I was like, what is all that stuff right there? Those are birds. And then I'm like, well, why all the birds right here? And then I realized it's because the influent comes in right here and the birds are getting a pretty pretty easy snack on the front end. And I'll tell you, ever since I started working in wastewater lagoons, I am not the biggest fan of wild game, uh, wild fowl specifically, because I know where they get their lunch. Uh, mixing, super important. As I mentioned earlier, a, a seven, a seven foot aerator might create a 125 foot diameter of mixing. So a lot of mixing can happen in a small spot, provided you do it right. And the more you mix, the more you're gonna get out of that cell. It's just, again, aeration is amazing and mixing is amazing. It is amazing. I know they're kind of the same thing, but I wanna beat that into your heads. So if you look here, this might be a facultative pond, facultative meaning zilch. We've got no air going into it. This is a partial mix pond right here. 2, uh, 2 SCFM to 5 SCFM, standard cubic feet of air per minute per thousand cubic feet of volume. And um, then we have vigorous mix right here. Uh, you can see we are concentrating the air in a smaller space. You see more air per volume. And then you look down here, this is complete mix, pretty flipping intense. These aerators are right on top of each other. Um, the reason that we do this is the closer we get the aerators, the more we get mixing in a cell, the more that we can treat. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So earlier I said facultative, no aerators out there, you know, nothing's going on, you're just getting wind action and, and transfer from the surface. So in this case, let's say we've got a pond that's one MGD flow in a 10 million gallon pond, and we've got to get that BOD down to 30 milligrams a liter. If we had no aeration, even in a 10 million gallon pond, if we had no aeration, we could only treat 55 influent, influent BOD to get down to 30 milligram, milligrams a liter on the tail end. It's a big, it's actually not big, it's a tiny difference. We're just not treating that much facultative. If we increase the mixing, the partial mix, 
Now in that same footprint, we can treat 150 milligrams a liter down to 30 milligrams a liter just by adding some air. Not perfect air, some air, but it gets better. If we go to vigorous mix, we can treat 400 milligrams a liter in that same footprint down to 30 milligrams a liter. Complete mix over 1,000 milligrams a liter down to 30. And if you get a little bit crazy, you want to go complete mix RAS. We've got a few of these out there. We can treat 5,000 milligrams a liter or more in that same footprint that we could only treat 55 facultative. Long story short, we can treat 100 times the same water or loading in the same footprint by adding mixing. So when people tell me lagoons can't do it, we have an industry coming into town and you know we're just not going to be able to handle it and we need an SPR or whatever. I'm like, guys, no, you can do it in the same footprint. We just have to teach this old dog new tricks. Keep that in mind. Lagoons can do that. So your typical lagoon might get down to 30 milligrams a liter of BOD, 30 TSS, 5 milligrams a liter of ammonia in the summer, and if it's a cold climate, it might bump up to 20. TN of 20 to 30, organic nitrogen of less than 3, pH that will stay pretty neutral. Um, normal lagoons run at 2 milligrams a liter of DO, and it can get phosphorus. Most lagoons get phosphorus down to 5 to 7 milligrams a liter, at least municipally. But if we teach that old dog new tricks. If we want the lagoon to do it better, we can upgrade the lagoon to get BOD less than 10, TSS less than 15, ammonia basically non-detect, total nitrogen less than 10, organic nitrogen we can't really touch that much, um, but we can talk more about that in a later module. pH is pretty much untouched. If you need to, we can get your, air, your DO to saturation. And phosphorus, we can get it down to 0.5 milligrams a liter or lower with a lagoon system without major upgrades. So something to keep in mind, lagoons can do it better. So I'm gonna do a Q&A request right now. And I have this photo, uh, you know, let's start with a Q&A request. Please type in your Q&A or question request here in the, um, the webinar here. And Eve is gonna read me a couple questions at the tail end. And whatever we don't get to, I will, or someone will respond to you hereafter. And why do I have this photo here? Because I found it on Google Images and I couldn't let it go. Look, you know, we're in an industry where the, all the older operators, the old guards retiring, and there's not a lot of new people. We got to get new millennials in here, new Gen Zers. So apparently SpongeBob had a Goo Lagoon session. So I think it's pretty funny. And uh, I wanted to add that here. I got an office photo in earlier. Hopefully somebody young on here got that, got that meme. Uh, trying to spice it up a little bit. All right, here we go. Um, how do you ensure that the placement and weight of riprap doesn't tear the liner? And what thickness of liner do you typically use? Those are very good questions. And I'm just going to be honest, I don't have that on the tip of my tongue. Uh, I know there are standards for thickness of liner and it, it is measured in mils. And I don't recall if it's 60 mil or what it is. That is something that I, I, I apologize. That's some, something I would ask a liner manufacturer. Uh, the same goes for, for riprap size. They're going to tell you what riprap is appropriate for what size liner. And they'll probably give you a grade of rock that they recommend to work with their specific liner. But in general, you know, we're experts in lagoon systems overall. And when it gets to this nuanced stuff, I rely on the experts uh, that deal with liner specific things all the time. Are solar aerators practical for lagoons? I, so. My experience with solar aerators is that's a little bit of a misnomer. They're solar mixers, um, and there's a number of them out there, or there's some that are even powered. They don't necessarily have to be solar. Some have batteries that operate at night, a lot of them don't. Um, my general experience is that they mix, they do their job, and then they aerate as a secondary function, just because they're mixing and bringing lower dissolved oxygen up to the surface. They are promoting some aeration, but I wouldn't put it on the same level of quote unquote aeration as a surface aerator or coarse level diffusers or, or whatever kind of diffuser. Um, it's kind of a, a minor effect. It's like an advanced, you know, you're adding a little bit more wind kind of aeration to the area. Um, I would say we don't see them used very often. And, we uh, at least we don't spec them that frequently uh, because they're pretty expensive. You know, they could be twenty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a piece when you could toss seven thousand dollars of aeration out there and get more mixing and more air and more spots um, if you have the power and the air to do it. But we'd recommend probably going that direction. Um, where we do see them though is essentially big bodies of water that are so big that they're essentially like a lake. And a lot of polishing cells or storage cells are like this. 
and the water in there is mostly clean. It doesn't need tons of aeration, but the operator or the engineer wants to make sure that cell is turned over a little bit so it doesn't get the spring turnover or the fall turnover. Tossing a couple of solar aerators out there, maybe we're choosing solar because it's probably more expensive to get you know, power out there or then it would not to be. So we use solar in that case. Um, that will help the pond to turn over a little bit, but I would, yeah, I, I caution to call it a solar aerator because it's, that's not its primary function. It's primarily a circulator first. What can you do with TKN? TKN, total Keldahl nitrogen is uh, ammonia, ammonium, and organic nitrogen. So <laughs> ammonia and ammonium, for all intents and purposes, let's just call them the same thing. It's NH3, it's NH4. It depends on the presence of water where it seals an ion and pH or blah, blah, blah. Let's just call those two things ammonia and organic nitrogen. Ammonia is something that you can treat in a lagoon system, especially in warmer climates, down to one to five milligrams a liter in the warm months. One of the Achilles heels of lagoons is they don't treat ammonia very well in the cold months. So additional processes are required to be dropped into your lagoon or bolted onto your lagoon to do it. You know, Triple Point has one, all the big manufacturers are dealing with this and we can treat ammonia down to non-detect. As long as the water is not an ice cube, basically we can do it. It just takes an extra piece of equipment. Uh, it, probably upgrading that lagoon, teaching it a new trip to do that. Organic on the other side, Ah, organic kind of funky. Organic, it's not like it's one kind of nitrogen. Organic means nitrogen bound up either in the cell walls of living things, so it's in an algae cell, and that algae cell does not want to be eaten. It wants to protect that stuff. It's a, it's a building block of its life. So it's hard for us to get to it because it's protected in the algae, or it's bound up into something else, like synthesized into a protein or something. And before we can get to that nitrogen uh, molecule, we have to break down that protein. Now, as those proteins flow through the lagoon system, the bacteria works on it and works on it, and over 30 or 40 days, it will start to hydrolyze some of that organic nitrogen, but it doesn't happen quick, and it's difficult to, have to force because the pr a protein coming from a milk producer might be different than a protein from an animal slaughter operation or something like that. So it's, it's, it's tough for us to diagnose exactly. So lagoons will reduce it. Um, but in general, we see getting really low organic nitrogen is tough. If you have an industrial plant that's pumping out 50 milligrams a liter of organic, that's a, that's a tricky situation that needs to be dealt with on a kind of case-by-case -case basis because that needs a special kind of surgical solution. Um, but usually municipally, we don't see that much organic. We might see five, 10 milligrams a liter coming in and three milligrams a liter coming out. So it only adds, we'll say three milligrams a liter to that TKN value. The big lever that we can affect there is the ammonia. Can you circulate sludge from pond one to pond two and or reanimate the sludge? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we've done it um, and unintentionally in some cases. Um, so sludge is not like, there's varying degrees of sludge. Sludge is like grit and rock and clay and crap that gets in there and it's really heavy. It's also bits of plastic, it's also, clay-like solids and then you have like kind of soft solids and on top of that you get really almost liquid fluffy solids um so if you put an aerator down there you can stir up solids pretty quickly some people will put a propeller down there and they'll stir it up you can stir it up in a variety of ways um and we for example like if you look at this lagoon right here on screen we've had a situation in an industrial plant that had just tons of sludge they're like we want to remove this sludge it's going to cost us i don't know a half a million bucks. Let's put some aerators out there to see if we can stir it up or treat it first. So they created a, they put two baffles in going across and created a strip where they put aerators. And they dropped the aerators down and they put it in a complete mixed situation. Those aerators are just churning up sludge. In the process, they're throwing the sludge up into the water column where it can be broken down. Um, the bacteria can get to it. It's not compacted at the bottom. And then some of the other sludge is blown out the back end because it's, it's kept in circulation. And as the water pushes through, it will move from one to the other. I would say it's a imprecise science to want to do it that way. Um, one of the easier ways to do it would be to either drain the pond and actually physically move it, drain the pond, and then use a pump. Once it's pretty low, you can use a little, little uh, propeller to kind of stir it up in a pump to suck it up and move it around on the bottom. There's some companies that will do it for you, or you can get a dredge to get out there and suck it up and pump it to another pond. And that's not cheap, but 
the biggest cost of sludge removal is not the dredge, it's the where the hell do we put it when we're done with it and how do we dispose of it or remediate it. If you're just moving it from one pond to the other, that would be a cheaper way of doing things. But the answer is absolutely yes, you can do that. We're a little over time, so we'll make this the last one. What is the maximum depth of sludge that can be accumulated before requiring dredging? There's no hard and fast rule here. Um, I mean, let me let me give an example. Sludge is a funny thing. Um, you know, I, I've had people that are like, oh, we don't have no sludge. There's no sludge out there at all. It's 10 feet of water. And we've gone and tried to drop an aerator out there and the aerator that's supposed to be sitting on the bottom sticks out of the surface of the water. It just sits on sludge, you know, a foot or two beneath. Um, it's a black box. It's tough to know how much you have. So you can get out there and measure it. Um, but there is no like, 30% of a lagoon is too much or whatever. It's it's a it's a gradual thing. I would say if your lagoon was designed with sludge storage, let's say two feet, and you're up four feet, I would start considering getting rid of that um, because that's a big burden from a BOD standpoint in the bottom of the pond. And that sludge is also taking the place of treatment and water, treat, area that we would expect treatment to take place. We're replacing that with just sludge. So now your pond has less HRT, and the more and more sludge you accumulate over time, the less and less treatment you're gonna get out of that lagoon system. And then the problem might not be an annoyance, it might become an imminent issue when you're busting permit every single you know, month on your DMRs. So it's, it's not like you get to this point and you gotta do it, it's something you monitor over time. I would say from a sludge standpoint, if you got six inches, you got a foot, unless you're like a three foot lagoon, that's fine. That's totally cool. If you start getting up into the multiple feet of sludge, uh, it, it can be a problem. Another thing that you should maybe do is test the volatile organic solids in the sludge. Um, we have a webinar on this. You can go watch an hour on sludge and you probably do a deeper dive. But basically what you can do is do a v um, VSS test on that sludge, figure out how much of it is organic. Um, and I'll tell you basically how much raw carbon and digestible stuff do you have out there and how much of it is just sand and grit and old dead bacteria. Um, because if it's volatile solids, that's more of a problem. That means it's a symptom. You're accumulating untreated waste. That's kind of like the Kraken that's going to come out to, to, to bug you someday if you don't deal with it. If it's just like clay-like solids and grit and whatnot, it's got low VSS, then it's not that big of a deal um, other than it's just taking up volume in your pond and eventually you got to remove it. So, okay, thank you, Eve. Um, if there are additional questions, and it sounds like there are, we will answer them individually to you. I really appreciate you guys coming here. This is a really fun thing for us to do. It's fun to create new content and to share information about the thing that we love and thing that we've been doing all the time. So really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. And I look forward to seeing you guys on the next one.